Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, the first in our new series, Advice and Perspectives from Friends of UConn, where UConn Center for Career Development will bring guests to you to talk about the career journey in these tumultuous times. We're planning a mix of alums and experts on starting, restarting, surviving career-wise in this economy. My name is Lisa McGuire, and I'm with the UConn Center for Career Development. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You should see your attendee interface on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Today's webinar is designed to be interactive with a Q&A format. I will ask Matt some prepared questions, but the value of this session is to have your questions answered. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to us by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel or the chat box. We encourage you to send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will address them throughout. Note that today's presentation is being recorded and will be provided to you within 48 hours. With that out of the way, Let's get to the reason we're all here. Please let me introduce our guest, alumni Matt Necci. A true partnership has one key attribute, authenticity. And whether Matt is in a business meeting, in the courtroom, or in the community, he's engaged and focused on helping those he encounters reach the full potential of their professional and personal goals. Matt's an experienced litigator and problem solver with considerable experience representing clients in multiple courts at virtually every level. Whether at work or outside the office, Matt thrives when he's at the service of others, which he believes is paramount to the success of an engaged and vibrant community. Matt's a member of the Board of Directors for Special Olympics Connecticut, currently serving as chair of the organization's development committee. He was formerly a member of the Board of Directors for both Leadership Greater Hartford, of which I'm an alum, and March Connecticut. Matt is a passionate advocate for the state of Connecticut's capital region, serving on the board of corporators for the iQuilt plan, a culture-based urban design plan for downtown Hartford to create a more walkable, sustainable, and welcoming downtown. Matt's been identified by his peers as a leader in both the community and the legal profession. He's been recognized as a rising star in 2013 to 2019 editions of Super Lawyers in the areas of workers' comp, state, local, and municipal law, and general litigation, and was also chosen as a member of the 2014 class for the Connecticut Law Tribune's New Leaders in the Law. In 2016, Matt was named to one of the Hartford Business Journal's 40 Under 40, an award that recognizes standing young professionals in the greater Hartford area who are excelling as emerging leaders. Thank you for being here, Matt. That's the bio, which is quite impressive. And Thank now you. I'll turn it over to you to share more about your personal journey. Well, thanks, Lisa. I appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, frankly, I think as we're all learning now, uh, whether it's professionally, school, friendship, um, you don't get anywhere without a lot of support and teamwork um, and people that have guided you along the way. So. Um, I've been incredibly uh, fortunate in my life, uh, frankly, to have incredible parents who are really good mentors and kind of guide me along the way. Um, my life, it was always, you have to work hard and earn everything you get, and you got to treat people really well. So um, that was kind of the, my mantra heading into not just my professional life, but even going into UConn. And uh my background at UConn, just so everyone knows, I've, I've been where you guys are. I've changed majors multiple times. Um, you know, getting back to my parents, I was lucky. When I entered the school, I was a business major. And then I thought I wanted to be a history teacher and changed to a history major. And then I thought I was going to be a journalist. So I told my parents I was changing to be a journalism major. And my parents very... Um, they, they respectfully listened to me and then they said, you will not be doing that. If you want to be a journalism major, you can do that, but you're going to do it with history. You're not going to just keep changing things. So um, that's what I ended up doing. And I, I didn't become a journalist or a history teacher, but I can tell you uh, the work that I did at UConn in both of those um, areas of study have immensely helped me uh, in my legal career. Um, I went into law school at a time where it was 
it was very competitive. There was a lot of people heading into it in the early 2000s. Um, but I also, um, one of the gains I had was being able to uh, research really well, but learn how to be a really persuasive writer and get to the point quickly. Um, and my UConn education has played a role into that. Even today, I've been working on an appellate brief and I very much use the tools that I had at UConn up to the present day. So um, love UConn, incredibly passionate about the university, uh, and I'm excited to talk to people today. That's great. I guess that teaching plan did help you with your homeschooling that you're doing now with your kids. I am. So I do have, uh, I'm married to a teacher. Uh, I uh, am a sibling of a UConn professor. I have in-laws that are teachers and principals. So um, with all that support, I am not a good fourth grade teacher and I am not a good first grade teacher. Uh, I have immense respect for my children's uh, teachers. Um, but it is, uh, you know, we live in interesting times and uh, it's not easy being a parent, being a uh, working, trying to have a career, and also being a good spouse and a good educator all at the same time. So um, I think my the life I have and the issues I'm dealing with right now are different than what some of the students are going through right now. Um, but I think people should be reassured that no one has this figured out 100%. And I don't care if you're 10 years old, 20 years old, 100 years old. Um, everyone at different stages of life right now is dealing with a completely unknown unique and different thing and we're all having our struggles and uh, frankly I've, I've found that to be comforting and that we're not going through this alone there's billions of people that are going through what we're all going through right now you're right um so matt um i know that you were at you when you were at uconn uh we suffered the tragedy the nation as a nation of 9 11 yep. um which is arguably one of the, the closest times we've come to the economic and personal uncertainty of this pandemic uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be on campus at that time and how it affected your plans, maybe your friends' plans for post-graduation? How did it change perspective or your approach to your work? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, I, I remember it vividly. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, you hear your grandparents talk about where they were when Kennedy was shot or when Pearl Harbor happened. Um, I can tell you exactly where I was when September 11th happened. I was in a classroom in Monteith uh, and someone came running into the room and said, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. Um, we didn't really, as a class, I was in a class of like 25 people think much of it because it was the first plane. I mean, I was certainly concerned. I had some family members that were in the building, um, but it was more, it sounded like an accident at that point. And then I went to another class, a journalism class in Arjona, um, with the late, great uh, John Breen, whose son Tom is still uh, a university employee and uh, one of my pals on Twitter. Um, and at that point, the second plane had hit and Professor Breen very clearly said, this is a big deal. You really need to go home and be with your families. Um, and my sister was a, is a professor at UConn and had an office uh, in the same building. I, I remember going up and watching on TV while it all happened um, and the buildings fell. And then, you know, I was going back to my dorm. It wasn't a dorm room. I was very lucky. I was the first person to live or part of the first class to live in Hilltop Apartments. So I had a it was a nice situation as a as a college junior. But uh, getting to my my uh, apartment and the board reading, your mom called. We're not sure if your uncle's alive and you need to come home. And so I think. Uh, I can say emotionally, that's probably the closest to what we're feeling now, just the unknown and like we, no one's been through this before. Um, so I think, you know, in addition to having those memories, I remember uh, writing an email that day to my wife, well, now wife, then girlfriend saying like, I can't even imagine trying to start a family in a world where something like this could happen. I, I vividly remember writing that email. And um now I'm married and I have two kids, right? So um, I don't want to say people move on quickly because we don't. I think one of the things humanity has shown is we can take a punch on the chin, we can go through these things, and then we we grow accustomed to a new normal. So, um, you know, in that time in my life, and I had made the decision to go to law school, I had the chance to stay home in Connecticut uh, where my family was still in Glastonbury, or I had a chance to go to law school in New York. 
um, and my family's all from Brooklyn, New York originally. Um, and I took the opportunity. I thought it would. Um, I didn't want to be reactive and kind of be down because it was just a sad time in the world. So I wanted to go and be part of New York as it was kind of coming back and rebuilding. Uh, my first year of law school, I lived in Park Slope in Brooklyn, but my second and third year of law school, I lived on Wall Street right across the street from the trade, uh, from uh, the stock exchange. I walked past ground zero four or five times a day, every day for two or three years. And um, again, you can see how tragedy, if you go back to lower Manhattan now, it's this thriving area of young families. And when I was there, um, it was similar, you know, I'm a huge proponent of Hartford and I think Hartford's going in the right direction, but historically what people have thought of Hartford over the last 20 years where it's a nine to five city, that's what lower Manhattan was when I was there. It was really busy during the day, but at night and weekend it was empty. So um, I think the where I can say to students now, um, for this is a long-winded way for that uh, particular story is no one was really sure, you know, the stock market, was closing, no one wanted to get on planes, um, people wanted to stay closer to home. Um, you know, I, I had a little bit of a benefit of a, I, I don't wanna call it a cushion because I came out with three more years of school and $150,000 of law school loans, but I had a little, a few more years to kind of ease into a job. Um, although when I graduated law school, I had no guarantee of a job and I had all these loans, which was a little bit uh, hard to take on too. So. Um, but I did. I had friends that struggled getting jobs. I can tell you, um, after I did graduate law school, the first thing I did, because I didn't have a job and I was waiting to hear if I had passed the New York and the Connecticut bar exams, I took a job at my old high school being a substitute Spanish teacher. Uh, and I had not taken Spanish since my junior year of high school. So I can tell you how well that went for not just me, but for the students as well. Um, and so I think People have to be creative. You can be really reactive to a negative situation or you can be proactive and say, I can't control everything. Here are the two or three things I can control and I'm gonna move like a bat out of hell to make sure I control those two or three things. And that's kind of the attitude I had both in that time. Um, and then as I kind of moved on, um, we can talk about the economic downturn in 2007, 2008 as well, because that was also a pretty crazy time. So, um... Why don't, why don't we segue to that? How do you sure. think it affected your um, psyche? You talked a little bit about your psyche, but did it affect um, your friends differently? Did, your, did it affect your friendships or your productivity or your career goals? Did, did things noticeably change? And, and sort of, if you can, and, and maybe you can't, um, compare sort of do you think it was similar to what students are going through now and how can they be resilient the way you were? And were all your friends as, resil as resilient as you are and were? I think my situation, and I, and I can move on to talk about what some of my friends dealt with. My situation was a little bit different. Um, I got engaged during my last year of law school. And so when I came out, uh, again, took the bar exam, which was its own thing. And you learn after three years of law school, you learn more in a month and a half of studying for the bar exam than you do for three years of law school. Um, but so I was coming out with, again, $150,000 of loans, knowing I was getting married. And then probably uh, three months after I got married, my wife and I bought our first home. And so I was 25 years old as all this was going on. And I think that's probably... I don't want to sound like the old guy in the room. Um, I think 25 now is probably on the younger side of things to, to get married, buy a house and start that part of your life. Um, but I did have friends who struggled and um, some wanted to go to college. College wasn't for them. And so they had to move into a different thing where, again, they had school loans, but then they didn't even have a degree to work off. So they were in the service industry and having to really kill themselves to make sure that didn't stay in debt forever. Um, I had friends that, um, because I think they wanted to avoid, I don't know if avoid reality is the right way, or it was just the, the reality of the circumstances. They realized when they came out of school, a degree in music for them, for where they wanted to be in life. If, you know, living in East Hartford, Connecticut or Manchester, Connecticut, 
probably not the best place to have a music degree unless you want to become a music teacher. If you really wanted to get into more of the entertainment sphere, you had to move to a larger city. Um, and so I think some people that were willing to bet on themselves, but also willing to, again, take it on the chin and sacrifice and realize, I'm not going to come out of school making $150,000. You know, my first job as a lawyer, I was making $55,000. When I decided to become an attorney, that was not the expectation I had in the back of my head um, when I came out with $150,000 of loans. And so I think there was a lot of moving parts back then that I would probably be similar to now. Um, but I think one thing that should be reassuring, and I've spoken to people, students in the history department uh, last year, the year before for uh, Huskies Forever Weekend. And one of the questions we were getting was, I have a history degree. And I'm not sure I want to be a historian or a history teacher. What can I do with this degree? And we had five people on the panel. And I don't remember what everyone did, but you had me as an attorney. You had a gentleman who was a vice president at a, a large bank in Connecticut with a history major. Um, you had someone who was a political scientist. And then you had the person who is NASA's chief of staff for the Mars mission was a history major at UConn. And so I think. Um, I think college, and I say this to people all the time, I think your your degree and your grades are very helpful in helping you land that initial job. Um, similar to attorneys that graduate from Yale or University of Chicago Law, that first job, they're gonna have much more easier access than someone that went to Northwest Louisiana State Law School, whatever. Um, but once you're actually in the field, your character, your hard work, and your actual actions and work product are going to dictate where your career goes after that. And so my advice for people coming out now and figuring out what they want to do, get a job, get a paycheck. Um, and my parents always said to me, I keep going back to that because I, I don't want them to see this recording, but I actually listened to some of the stuff that said to me. The best time to look for a job was when you had one. And so it's easier for you to be looking for a job, even if you're frustrated, if you have money coming in, you can pay your bills, than if you don't have anything and you're really killing yourself without the benefit of having a paycheck. So that would be kind of my, that's a constant, whether you were, you know, at UConn with me 15, 20 years ago, or you're there now. Thanks. Um, so you talk a lot about your parents, which is good to hear as a parent, um, but, uh, and your kids will probably admit that down the road in a <laughs> while, um, but um, what what resources, if any, did you turn to either academically or personally after any of the, the downturn? So you talk about two major um, worldwide kind of things, um, things you couldn't control with the economy, um, whether it's the downturn in the economy or the terrorist attacks. Um, what resources did you turn to? And, and also, um, how do you balance the self-care while you're, while you're trying to deal with it and, and while you're maybe even in the job search mode like a lot of our graduating students are? Yeah, um, well, you know, I love people. And so I think the best thing you can do is talk to people. Um, you know, whether you made the choice to go to UConn because it was your first choice, because the cost was right, because your parents went there, you're at UConn. And so there are benefits that come with being at UConn, huge alumni base, uh, international reach with the name. Um, there are some frustrations that come with that, right? It's a huge university. Um, it's, you're, you're not at a 3,000 person university where you have 10 people in a class and it's easy to get all the help you need. I think when you're at school or whether you're uh, um, an undergrad or whether you're looking for a job or frankly, when you have a job, there's only so much people can do to help you. We can provide you resources, and I can tell anyone that's on this now or anyone that watches after the fact, my information is pretty easily available online. Call me up, shoot me an email. I'll get together with anybody for coffee or lunch, a drink, whatever. Um, but resources are only so much. Unless you are willing to engage people and to put yourself out there, we could provide you all the resources in the world. The people that do really well and the people that are incredibly respected career-wise are the ones that take responsibility for achieving what they want to achieve. Um, 
don't get me wrong, there are circumstances and exceptions to the rule where sometimes people just get dealt a bad hand. For the most part, um, people that I know that have been really impressive had said, irrespective of their bad hand, they figured it out because they, again, they had a path, they had something they wanted to do, and they weren't going to let anything get in their way. Um, I think after the fact, you have to be willing to know that you have not, you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, I have uh, friends who've had kids later in life and they think they're the first people to have a child. And so I always laugh at that because I say, you know, like irrespective of your religious beliefs, at a minimum, people have been having kids for thousands of years and more likely it's been like hundreds of thousands of years, right? So you're not the first one to do this and you're not going to be the last one and you should take some, um, I think you should relax by knowing that. So everyone's going through what you're going through. But again, you have to be willing to know that you don't know everything. Um, I will never tell people I'm the smartest person in the room because I'm clearly not. I tend to have more common sense than most people and I'll work really hard and I don't mind screwing something up if it helps me learn. And so um, what I have found are people that can be your mentors, whether it's in your personal life or professional life. If you're willing to work hard and ask questions and not go into something thinking you've got it all figured out already, they tend to gravitate to those people and they want to help you along. Um, I can't, you know, one of the benefits I think students have right now that probably didn't exist 50 years ago, or maybe it did, and it's just, a, again, it's me ignorant, not thinking about what other generations look at for the subsequent generations, but there are such low expectations that are unfair. Um, I think current students aren't even millennials, but the term that you hear in, in, in the media all the time is millennial this, millennial that. I don't even know what I am if I'm generation X or millennial, whatever. Um, but there are such low expectations. People think that some, just because someone can do something quickly because they're very, very um, savvy tech-wise that they're lazy because they did it quickly. If you show up now and you work hard and you have common sense and you treat people with respect, you are going to be perceived to be a rock star. And no matter what conversation I have um, with people one-on-one -on -one or doing something like this, I say that all the time. Um, I think it's ignorant to think people are younger people are lazy and don't work hard now. I think younger people appreciate things differently, just like my parents appreciated things that were different than what, you know, my parents are first generation Americans. What they appreciated in life is completely different than what their parents appreciated in life. So, you know, I say take advantage of that ignorance. And if someone's going to think you're lazy because of your age and where you came from, let them make that mistake once, but don't let them make that mistake twice. They should know very clearly that you are there to get a job done and to be part of something hopefully bigger than yourself. I mean, that's kind of what, what my thing has been is I want to work hard because I want to grow and be, I'm just curious by nature. I love being part of what's going on in the world. And so if I'm working someplace, I want to be part of the growth that's happening there. Um, and if they don't appreciate that, I want to be, training myself and learning so that the next stop is going to be a place where that's really going to appreciate the things that I value. So let's let's um compare or or let's go a little deeper to you've just you've just made the point that you should talk to people, enjoy yeah. people, take advantage of all those opportunities, but in this environment there's isolation and yeah. um people physic can't unite and physically together to support one another physically there's no physical connection um how how do people take your advice and how to how do how do students move forward and and sort of emulate some of the things you're talking about or or do that with this current situation what are you doing to stay connected yeah. and and what suggestions you have for them i think um First and foremost, I would say stop looking at this, if you can, as a problem. I think the people that are going to thrive right now are the ones that look at this as an opportunity. And so if you have a mentor relationship already, or let's say you've been discussing with a, an employer a potential job, whether it's on the phone, whether it's email, or whether it's something like this, um, a web chat, 
they'll be really impressed if you make an effort to reach out to them to have a discussion. Um, you know, I interview people all the time. Uh, I haven't had anyone contact me right now that I've interviewed in the last month or so that have said, hey, is there anything I can do? Just trying to keep um, a dialogue going. I would be pretty impressed if someone did that. Um, from my perspective, again, I, I love people. So I'll give you an example. Um, tonight, I miss sports a lot. Um, tonight, I'm going to be watching the NFL draft. And my law school buddies are going to be on the other side of a Zoom call. And we're going to act like we're in a room together watching it and have a beverage and keep that dialogue going. Um, you know, phone calls are great. But I've had a few meetings this week where we decided to do Zoom calls instead of a phone call. And it did like psychologically made a big difference being able to see someone and see how they're doing and frankly, even see them in their own space. You know, one of the things my firm's doing is having people send videos and pictures of their home offices and our social media. We're kind of saying, you know, lawyers are people too. So see them in their kind of home setting in their home office. Um, but again, I, it's easy and I know it's easy because I find myself in that space sometimes. Like, it's tough to get yourself really jacked up for the day sometimes. Um, so I really, I, I spend 45 minutes on my Peloton tread every day and then walk three and a half miles with my kids and my wife. Um, I think exercise and really beating yourself physically so that you're just so mentally, your brain just out there. I think exercise is incredibly important right now. Um, but I, again, I think this is an opportunity. The people that want to stay in touch, they're gonna do it. Um, frankly, I think if anything else, this should be making people realize how much they appreciate the connections that they have. Um, you know, um, I have family that live all over the country. Um, I, having to explain to my seven-year-old when their grandparents come over and stand in the driveway, why they can't hug them. It's a really awkward conversation to have. Um, never anything I expected. So, you know, I'm, I can tell you next time my kids can hug their grandparents, that's going to be a really nice long hug. So, um, I, again, I think just staying in communication with people, however you do it. Um, I'm, I'm an obnoxious UConn Twitter fan. So I've got my own family on there where we like just making fun of each other or talking about UConn related stuff. So um, I think you have to get creative. Uh, I think the generation behind me is probably better at that. Like I'm saying Twitter, there's got to be like six other social media things that have come out since Twitter that I just don't deal with. Um, so I, I, I think there is a way to be creative. Um, but the woe is me. This is really hard. This is really hard again for billions and billions of people. And I can tell you in five years, we're going to learn about some businesses or some novels that, you know, the next JK Rowling or the next Steve Jobs came out of this, where people were stuck in their house and some people were really upset about it and didn't do anything. And some people were really upset about it and said, there's no way I'm gonna live my life like this for the next few years and here's what I'm gonna do. And they're gonna transform the world. That's just how, that's how humans are. So, um, hopefully we can all transform the world in some way, but I think doing something where you, again, think it's something you can control and you can kind of attack and be proactive as opposed to just being reactive is, is the mindset you need to have right now. That's great. That's very positive. Thanks for that positivity. For the less ex extroverted of the world, which pretty much you set a kind of high bar on that extroversion thing. Um, what would you suggest? What are your recommendations for your fellow Huskies and, and advice and encouragement um, for the extrovert, but also for that that introvert who's looking at you right now, saying, "Oh my God, I I that I I can't I can't do that." Um, they're just feeling pent up and yeah. Well, I guess there's a couple things I would say. One, you have to be yourself, right? So if if you're not someone that is I am how I am because of how I was raised and how the chemicals in my brain worked before I even knew what was going on. Um, my wife is less that way and she loves journaling and reading books. Um, 
I'm an awful guitar player. So even when I need some quiet time, I'll go sit and again, do the guitar. I think you have to find the things that you're passionate about in life. And um, let's be honest, it's not like extroverts have the monopoly on being passionate about something. Some of the most creative people I know are people that are a little bit more internalized about things. And that's why they're so creative because their mind is constantly spinning. Um, and they're thinking about how the world is affecting them or how they can affect the world. So um, I think dive into the things that you're already passionate about. And again, there is no right or wrong answer. If I could tell you this is the way to turn the light switch off and your life's going to be perfect, I would give it to you. I would only give it to you, congrats, but I would give it to you in a heartbeat. Um, but, you know, part of this is knowing what information to take from someone like me that's going to help you. But there's stuff I'm saying for the attendees today or the people watching that they're going to say, that's not me. And I can appreciate that. Um, so I think the, the, the big focus in all this is, this is a brief, hopefully once in a lifetime thing that's happening. We have to take it. And then we have to just kind of tread water. If, if all this is is treading water until the quote unquote normal comes back, that's okay. I think what we have to appreciate is just like, you know, going back to September 11th, you know, I grew up in a world, I, I'm a kind of a unique, I'm 38 years old. I'm at a unique point um, of the world in that I grew up without the internet and things with technology were really, cell phones were starting to really boom when I was in early and late high school. So I kind of have the benefit of remembering what the world was like before you had a phone attached to you all the time, but also being young enough when all of this was happening where I think I could grow up with it a little bit easier than someone that was 20 years older than me. So, um, you know, we just have to deal with this and, th and then move on to the next stage. But, you know, just like after September 11th happened, if, you, if you're not old enough, and I, I think UConn students wouldn't know this, you don't, you don't know what like life is like to not know the word terrorism. That wasn't a thing 20 years ago. It just wasn't. It was something you'd see on like a naked gun movie uh, comedy, right? It was a comedy act where they would make a, a ignorant racial joke. And that was what people thought about terrorism back then. Um, so we're going to have to adjust. We, You could walk into New York City buildings, office buildings 25 years ago, and no one was checking your bags. Um, Airports have always been pretty tight, but they got a lot harder after the fact. So people have had to learn with a new normal. There are some things, and this is me putting on my constitutional law hat. There are some things that society accepted as changing and allowed to become the new normal. And then there was some overreaching that happens, whether it's government, personal, whatever, that people push back and say, no way, we're not comfortable with this. And so that'll be kind of an interesting thing. Uh, again, this is me with my attorney hat on the next couple of years, seeing what we allow to become the new normal and what we're willing to say, no, we're not giving up A, B and C. And we're going to take our chances with um, lack of vaccines or whatever the next pandemic is going to be. That's right. Um, so I, I've got a question here from someone that says, you seem to have a lot of great connections and a strong network. Um, how could how might continue networking with others during this pandemic. Most or many professionals and companies seem to be overwhelmed by what's going on. And so is it appropriate to still reach out about opportunities? And if so, how should I do so without while being respectful of that situation? That's, that's a great question. Um, I would have to look into this a little deeper, but my recommendation for people coming out of UConn particularly if you're gonna stay in Connecticut, which I hope a lot of people do. I think this is a great place to raise a family and have a career. Um, look up, uh, if you're in the greater Hartford area, Hype, the Hartford Young Professionals and Entrepreneurs, which is the Metro Hartford Alliance, um, runs a great young professional networking group made up of people in Connecticut and outside that came from outside of Connecticut. I'd have to check. I'm pretty confident an organization like that is figuring out a way to virtually keep people connected. Um, in New Haven, I believe it's called Pulse. So there are organizations for young professionals that are really catering to networking of people that are either probably less so undergrads, but more so people that are kind of on that senior year into grad school or starting their career. I, I would look into organizations like that. Um, 
but I, the reason I say the question is great is, you know, as Lisa said earlier, I'm on a few nonprofit boards and that's a conversation nonprofits are having right now because like a lot of private businesses and universities, it's incredibly difficult to maintain a business right now. Um, there is government assistance, but the reality is a lot of people that own small and medium sized businesses three months ago, those aren't going to exist in three more months. And nonprofits, which very often deal with uh, the generosity of people that are donating money are having that same exact discussion now. How do we, in a professional way that's not going to ruin a relationship, ask people for help, but also, you know, using the quote unquote bedside manner, knowing where you are in the world. And if someone's losing their job, I can't ask them for help, but, you, you know, being able to read that room. And so, I think it's very much dependent on the organization that you talk, you're talking about. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, I network a lot and attend things, I don't just go to something and then move on to the next thing. I'm looking to cultivate a relationship that's going to last years. And so when I'm networking or marketing myself, I don't go in with the intention of saying, this person's going to help me with my career and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to turn it. They're going to get me business for my law firm next month. I'm looking to develop a personal relationship with a person so that in five years when they have an issue, they're calling me because they trust me because we've developed a real relationship. And so I think the only thing you can control now, I don't think anyone would turn off from wanting to stay connected. Um, if they are and they're not willing to work with you or even have a discussion going forward, I'm not sure it's an organization you're going to want to be around long term. Um, I think and I wasn't lying when I said this, my information is pretty easily attainable. Um, and I love introducing people. I love connecting people. If you have a particular interest or you think I can help you connect with someone, give me a call, shoot me an email. There's a good chance either I know someone that you can connect with that can help you out. Or if I don't, I know someone who knows someone. And that's one of, frankly, the beauties of being in Connecticut. It's a population state. We have a few million people, but it's a close community. And the people that are really involved with things tend to be the same couple hundred people that are involved with everything. And so there are uh, negatives to that, like having to go to a lot of after work dinners that my wife and kids don't want me to go to. Um, but there are a lot of positives to that. There's relationships that I've built up over the last 20 years that, again, I'm not cold calling someone because I need something. It's a true relationship that I've you know, I care about the people that I'm dealing with. It's not just a professional thing. We have an actual relationship and people see that authenticity. If you're just calling because you're going in, there's nothing wrong with self-interest. Everyone has self-interest. But if you're only going in saying, how is this connection or this uh, relationship going to benefit me without necessarily considering what's on the other side and how you can help those people as well, I think that's the wrong approach to take. You need to know that there's a uh, give and, uh, and get a little bit. And like I said, everyone's going through this. And so part of the discussion may be, here's some of the assistance and guidance I need, but here's some skills I bring to the table too. How can I enhance what you're doing right now? Because you're clearly, you know, all these organizations are struggling right now. So I think that's the approach I would take is, what can I do to maintain that relationship? But what can I do to be an add-on to what they're doing now? Because that's really gonna get their attention as well. So do you think if somebody applied for job with either a nonprofit or a for-profit um, and and they should I think what I'm hearing you say is is they should follow follow the news and be sensitive to the situation which I think was was part of the question um, is it appropriate to follow up with them um, with that sensitive and sensitivity and authenticity I think that's what I'm hearing you say yeah I I think you know the, the world is in a tough spot, but it hasn't ended. And I think people are appreciative, particularly if you're talking about a job application. If they're in business, when things get going again, I think you're going to see an explosion of activity and they're going to need really talented people. And so the odds of you having a job or maintaining that relationship four months from now, when things get a little bit more normal, it's a much better if you're continuing that relationship and that communication now. And you don't have to be pushy about it. I think we all know that person that calls and they don't get it. They just keep calling and calling and calling. And it's hard for anyone to deal with that. 
but I do think you can, um, you know, check in with someone and say, here's where I am. Just want, it, it, and again, if you have applied for something, say, just wanted to let you know, you know, obviously everything is, is crazy right now, but I remain interested. And if there's anything else I can do to provide more information about myself, or if there's anything else I need to know about the opportunity, I would love to hear it. Hopefully, at a minimum, you're going to get a reply to that. If you don't, again, I'd move on to the next thing or be a little bit more patient. I think in Connecticut, things are probably, I think they're not going to get into normal soon, but I think, you know, it's late April. I, I think the reality is um, Memorial Day-ish, you're going to start seeing business operating a little bit more. It won't be back to normal, I think, until probably July 4th-ish, but I think by Memorial Day, you'll see more, much more activity. Um, that's what everyone's hoping. It, it, again, it's not going to be what it was three months ago, but it'll be a start of something. Um, and I, so I, I, again, as an employer, um, you know, we have 200 employees where I work. If someone contacted me and said, you know, we've been working from home or we haven't been able to work because there's just nothing for us to do. I'd want them to reach out to me, quite frankly, if someone was again, applying for a job, um, I would not be offended in any way if, again, one of the other things I say both to my kids and my wife's an English teacher uh, in a middle school, so I get to read some of the stuff that her students write. Before you send something, read it out loud, uh, make sure it sounds okay. Uh, one, I think it's not going to come off as authentic if it's a real over-the-top professional email. Uh, it shouldn't be overly conversational, but make it sound like some, like a question if you were asking me a question right now. I get that as being more authentic than if it's, it sounds like it's old English from when I'm watching Downton Abbey and uh, it's not 1877 anymore, right? So um, that's just the type of thing I would keep in mind. You say that, but today is Talk Like Shakespeare Day. Every day is like five <laughs> different things. So, um, okay, we, we should have done, we'll have to read film this later uh, in Shakespearean. Then we'll give that to your wife because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on that. Um, so Matt, I, I don't see any other questions. Are there any parting words um, like that you have advice? I know, I know firsthand. I can tell everyone um, that Matt means everything he says when he says reach out to him, and um, he's a true Husky help, who is interested in helping Huskies. Um, and uh, he does have a good network. I know that also firsthand, but um, is there any parting advice you have? Um, stay positive. I, I mean, I hear a lot of, of great, great advice, but are there any parting words that you'd like to, to share? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I, I gave a speech a couple months ago at a function that was talking about taking ownership of your community and making sure that if you want to see your community be a great place, you really have to take ownership and play a role in that. And I think similar principles can apply right now. Um, I don't mean to demean or diminish what people are going through right now, um, but we have to have perspective. And so people can assume someone's got a great life, things are going really well. That may be true for some aspects, but there's other struggles, right? Um, you know, I was talking about family, Two generations ago, my grandfather came here from Italy to get away from Mussolini, and a couple of years later, he was in the U.S. Army back in Italy fighting against Italy, right? So two generations ago, people that were college students' age were fighting a war across the globe to try to save the world. And frankly, we're doing something similar in a much different medical scientific way. But I think, you know, the whole, the, again, the whole woe is me, no one knows what this is like. I just think that's the wrong attitude to have. Um, again, I don't know anyone's circumstances, and so you may really have true struggles, but you have to appreciate people have been there before. People that work really hard tend to do really well. And, you know, the sign, I have a family motto. We had it printed, it's on, as my kids walk out to school every day, it says, work hard and be nice to people. And I really think if you work hard and you be nice to people and you take care of others, you're going to do really well in life. Um, and if there's anything I can do to help people, I will tell you, I do look at resumes that specifically say UConn before I look at anyone else's resume. Uh, my partners may not like that, but 
I don't care. I have a true passion for the university. I think the university is going in an incredible direction. Um, the, the quality of students there, amazing. I'm hopeful the quality of sports is coming back to where it was when I was in school. Um, but uh, again, I, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I love UConn and whatever I can do to help people, I'm happy to do. I, I appreciate that. So thanks again, Matt. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, the first of our advice and perspective series. You've truly shared some insight on opportunities in Connecticut and beyond and how to use your Husky network. Your positivity is definitely uplifting and we greatly appreciate the time you took to share your experience with us. You are truly an extrovert, Matt, and, and uh, I appreciate that. Thank um, you. As, as mentioned, this webinar is a part of an ongoing webinar series on careers and issues in this pandemic environment produced by the Yukon Center for Career Development. This is the first webinar in the series. Next week, we'll host a panel of recruiters from some of UConn's key corporate partners. They'll be sharing tips on the job search in the virtual environment, including pointers on virtual interviews, resumes, and the search itself. Please check the Center for Career Development's event calendar at career.yukon.edu for more information about upcoming webinars and more resources for your job search. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey on the presentation, and we'd appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. It'll help us for future programming. You'll also receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar so that Matt can share it with all of his friends. In addition, a recording of today's session will be available on the Yukon Center for Career Development website. We're excited about sharing more career advice and perspectives from alums and other UConn friends. Thanks again. Stay healthy, everyone. Too.